Last week, we reached a new step in the ever-escalating witch hunt against Donald Trump when the former president was indicted by a Manhattan grand jury for his alleged role in misconduct pertaining to what has been described as hush money payments to screen prostitute Stormy Daniels prior to the 2016 election. And this is, of course, unprecedented for a former president, but Donald Trump is not exactly like other former presidents, which is actually why this is all happening in the first place, as we know, as we will discuss. But on Monday, he flew to Trump Tower in New York City, and then on Tuesday, he turned himself in before the arraignment later that afternoon, followed by his scheduled return to Mar-a-Lago, where he delivered an address pertaining to the overall situation and with no gag order imposed. So since Donald Trump will be the first U.S. president, current or former, to face criminal charges, I think maybe an update on our current political dynamic is warranted, uh, since this is a pretty significant escalation, to say the least. So we will go over why they're saying this is happening, why this is actually happening, what this means for our politics going forward. The reasons why this is not a good thing, the reasons why this is a good thing, lessons to learn from this, what to be paying attention to, and what the future of our country is going to look like from its current trajectory. So do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Commie. It feels good to have the hat back on. The hat's back on. It's staying on. I'm back on Twitter. I'm back behind the desk again. It seems like the energy's shifting. Things are moving back to equilibrium. Order's being restored. Nature's healing. But yeah, we're not going to get too deep into the how and why this is happening. I did a whole video back in November, months ago. Longest video I've ever done. No topic more deserving, of course. Covering why this is happening, who's behind it, everything surrounding it, etc. So I'll put a link to that video in the description if you want to watch what is like literally the definitive analysis of Donald Trump. Like what makes him so different and so effective, how he permanently altered American politics and in particular conservative politics, why these people will never stop going after him. And that video has actually been endorsed by some pretty big names. But right now, I would rather talk about the state of the country, what this means going forward, since I think we're all mature and honest enough to know basically like why this is happening to Trump and Trump alone. I don't think we need to spend a ton of time entertaining the details of the case. Like, of course, it's nonsense, which, yeah, it's worth the spelling, but we're going to leave that to other people to do because I think there are more important lessons to take away from this than just Democrats are corrupt liars who are going to use the law to persecute their political opponents. Like, yeah, you know, it's like common knowledge. But regardless, Trump went to Manhattan where he turned himself in to be arraigned and then he flew back to Mar-a-Lago that evening where he delivered an address, which yours truly was invited to, but I actually, I had to decline because I needed to get this video out for you guys, and then I have to work on some stuff for later this week. Got to get back home in time for Easter. You know, my grandma, she's telling me she wants to dye Easter eggs with me. What am I going to do, argue with that? No. It's like, hey, sorry, you know, I know it's been a rough couple of weeks, but I, I, Mr. President, I'm sorry, you know, I've got a prior commitment that sort of requires my attendance. It's very, very complicated business. Um, but anyways, so the left is, of course, committed to this idea that Trump is just having justice served to him. This is totally fair, totally impartial. And obviously, we know that that's not true, judging from the countless examples of people on their side committing like far more severe crimes than what they're implying Trump is alleged to have done and at a far higher frequency and in far more conspicuous a manner. So just like know that as we move forward. Just know that when these people say like, well, nobody's above the law, like they don't mean that in any sense that's more legitimate or respectable than like a schoolyard tattletale, which by the way, isn't even to say that Trump did anything wrong, but these people hate Trump and therefore any crusade against Trump is legitimate and just, just like the impeachments, just like the Russia hoax, everything else in the last eight years, like it's all equally righteous and just and rooted in accountability. And that actually tends to be a more accurate understanding of power than we have on our side, because we had people on our side saying things like, you know, disabled is he should refuse to extradite Trump and make Florida a sanctuary state for him. And then you had like big accounts saying things like, um, actually, DeSantis doesn't have the power to do that under Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution. And I read that. I'm like, thank God. Like, thank God somebody said it right now. Like the beacons, because the Constitution's back. Just wait until the left hears about this. It's going to be like every episode of Fairly Odd Parents, you know, at the end where he's like, I wish everything would go back to normal. That's our country when Democrats find out that they're supposed to obey the Constitution. So we have this interesting dynamic where leadership in one party is actively maneuvering to jail the most popular figure in the other party who happens to be a former president openly intent on taking back the White House next election. And when people in this party realize this threat and start brainstorming ideas of how to fight back against it, the supposed thought leaders in this party are like, um, actually, the Constitution says you can't do this. So you can. It's like, okay, we've heard this a million times, still waiting on it to pay out for us. Okay, well, what's the alternative then? Like, what are these people proposing we do instead? They're saying another thing we've heard a million times with very little payout, that the pendulum is just going to swing back. Hey, relax. The Democrats, they're doing this. Let them. 
Because when we're back in charge, we're just going to do it right back to him. The pendulum's going to swing back. It's going to smack him right in the face. It's going to be totally epic. Is this even possible to believe? Like, when has that ever happened with significant consequences? People want this to be true so badly on our side. It's like this deeply embedded cope. And I don't know what the fixation about this is in particular. Like, they can only conceptualize politics as entertainment, which, yeah, it's entertaining, but it's not entertainment. And so they, like, get off to this idea. They get this idea in their head of, like, a character setting themselves up for retribution, for, like, dying by their own hand. It's like they think they're watching a WWE match, and it's like a tables match, right? You've got this wrestler. He's setting up a table to put the other guy through. He's on the turnbuckle. He's going to dive on him. But wait, he gets distracted, taunting the, the other guy's girlfriend. And now the wrestler catches him on the turnbuckle. What's he doing? Superplex. Superplex through the table that the other guy set up. He superplex him through his own table. Jim Ross has a heart attack, collapses at ringside. Ring the bell. That's like what this whole pendulum thing is. Like, first of all, it presupposes two things that aren't even true. Firstly, that the Democrats and or the establishment ever intend on us having serious power again. Like, it's obviously not the case. Evidenced in particular by the fact that they're doing this to literally prevent Donald Trump from entering the White House again. So it can't exactly be a pendulum if what the other side is doing is actively preventing your chances of ever getting near the levers of power again. It's really like more of a ratchet than a pendulum. And secondly, even when we get into power, our leadership has no balls. Like anybody who does have balls is either prevented from obtaining power or they're harassed with impediments which largely prevent them from being effective. Like what are we actually supposed to believe? Are we supposed to believe that the GOP leadership is going to indict Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, any one of these people, Anthony Fauci. Like, I don't think anybody actually believes that that's going to happen. But that's what the people trying to contain us in this pre-Trump paradigm of what passes for right-wing politics in this country. That's what they're trying to tell us. Like, just relax. It's going to come back to bite him. Like, yes, but not because of you, because me and my cool friends are actually going to see to it. But the Constitution isn't coming to save you. If it were, we wouldn't be here right now. Like, there's no such thing as a nation of laws. The people who pull the strings are always going to make exceptions for themselves, for their ends. Like, they're always going to persecute their enemies, uh, their ambitions. Like, the people who are in charge of enforcing laws, that's what matters. Like, the Constitution by itself, how it's designed to provide a framework for our laws, that's not going to save you. It's like the cardinal rule of government. Only the person in charge matters. If some bureaucrat doesn't want something to happen, he's going to like discover some portion of the law that, you know, oh, my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do. But if he does want something to happen, he's just going to like interpret the law in such a way as to allow that thing to happen. You know, sometimes this takes a few cycles of rinsing and repeating. It's like how we went from an implied right to privacy to you have a God-given right to kill your child at any point during pregnancy and for any reason. But the effect remains the same. And yeah, if you go to the courts, you're just simply changing the person in charge from a bureaucrat to a judge. And you're hoping that the judge is on your side, which probably means the side of the law, which is what is supposed to make judge is unique when compared to other government officials, but in practice, what we see is largely the same. Just more power actors making decisions based on what they want. This is just the way that things work, and the sooner we figure that out, the sooner we can catch up. And by the way, this is what George Soros figured out a long time ago, which is why he pays to install district attorneys like Alvin Bragg. Well, it's just following the law, right? They just prosecute, right? Well, no. No, it turns out that you can't just eliminate the reality of political power by like trying to democratize it into this algorithm. And in fact, that actually makes it worse because now it's pretty much impossible to have accountability. The courts, the bureaucracy, like what is the average person supposed to do to combat the damage that has been done to this country by actors wearing the labels of those institutions? I'm not saying our form of government is necessarily bad, by the way. I'm not saying the constitution needs to just be totally abandoned. I'm just saying what I've said for years. It's not enough. You can't just refuse to play ball. The left plays ball. The left plays for keeps. So they win. They understand how politics works. And one thing they understand very well is that in politics, you can literally do whatever you want. You figure out what you need to get done. You come up with the policies that achieve this either directly or by proxy. Come up with your PR strategy to quell the emotions of the masses. Come up with your legal strategy to get it through the courts. And then you just do it. Like, you can only not do it if you're prevented from doing it. That's actually how you win. Like, this is how you play for keeps and deliver for the people who elected you to make their country and their lives better. Well, we shouldn't do that. What do you, what do you mean we should? Like, this is how it works. This is why Donald Trump was indicted. Actually, one second, please. Since we're essentially discussing how the only relevant political virtue is loyalty, and I am loyal to iTarget, I think it's time to spread the truth. Father's Day is right around the corner. Oh, but I already have a laser bullet. Okay, we'll consider the following. Have you ever seen competitive shooters practice timing drills on the range? This is incredibly important for proficient marksmanship. And given the way certain groups of very normal and well-adjusted people are getting riled up, you may need to defend yourself against multiple attackers sooner than you may think. Now, imagine Imagine being able to do that 
at home anytime you want, never spending a dime on ammo. That's what the all new iTarget Cube does. The iTarget Cube is fully compatible with your existing laser bullets. You just buy one, upgrade to the three pack for a unique training experience. The world is your oyster. Compete with friends, practice clearing drills, or use random mode to test your ability to react all while the system times every shot you take. Right now, save 10% plus free shipping with the offer code DOYLE when you go to iTargetPro.com. iTarget comes in all calibers from nine millimeter to two, two, three, so you can train with almost any firearm. This is the easiest, most cost-effective way to train, and it pays for itself in a single day. That's the letter iTargetPro.com. iTargetPro.com, offer code DOYLE. Very epic, we continue. But yeah, it's like we said, you know, there's always reasons for these things being done, and usually they're indirect. Like for example, look at the Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg. Now, Alvin Bragg is probably genuinely just a low IQ diversity hire who believes that the reason differences in crime rates exist is something to the effect of $20,000 per student per year in funding instead of $25,000 per student per year in funding. That's fine, he can be the useful idiot, but the people who install these people into these positions, people like George Soros, they understand that it's beneficial to the people who pull the strings in this country to have violent criminals walking around basically terrorizing citizens with impunity because when you have fear, when you have low trust, when you raise the consequences of accurately describing the problems that we face, when you remove people's ability to be proud of their cities, be proud of their communities because you've turned them into shitholes, it makes it very difficult to reverse course. And the regime benefits from instability like this. That's why they don't go after criminals. You know, people are like, well, why could they be doing this? Like, what do you, what do you mean why? You know exactly why. If you explain this to an alien who is visiting Earth for the first time or to like an AI or something, asked it to infer a motive, it would tell you what you already know. People are like, oh, we'll never attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity. What does that even mean? Like, what do you think you're saying to me right now? Sometimes I hear people speak I genuinely believe that they're just trying to like prove that they can speak English to me. Like their words have no meaning or purpose beyond that. You know, people will just say little phrases like that as if they're just true. Like, like, okay, explain to me why we should never do that. Also, the complete quote contains a very important word, which I never hear comprehended by these people. Adequately. It's never ascribed to malice that which is adequately explained by incompetence. And guess what? The explanation from the standpoint of incompetence is inadequate. Like we're not talking about a child spilling milk and it's like the child is evil. No, he's just incompetent, okay? It's a child or something like that. We're talking about the most basic amenities of civilization. Criminals need to be dealt with and we're moving in the opposite direction. Like we're supposed to be conquering the stars, eliminating traffic, stopping the world from killing itself, but instead we're just babysitting. And Napoleon, by the way, a foremost combatant in the perpetual campaign against the global libtar menace, he would have taken this into account. Like, what if the malice installs the incompetence? What if the evil enables the retarded? And we tend to fall into this framework of thought because we can only conceive of running a country with the end goal in mind being to do so competently, or at least trying to, but when you abandon that framework and start to be a little bit more honest about our situation, you will at least find peace and clarity and that things start to make a lot more sense. Like, we're looking at the situation right now in Manhattan under Alvin Bragg, armed robbery, drug dealing, burglary, like these are all now classified as misdemeanor offenses, but felonious assaults are up 15%, major crimes up 22%. This guy's over here trying to go after Donald Trump for campaign finance violations, like violations that are so egregious that it's taken top priority. But, you know, who can blame the guy? I mean, you're not talking about murders, oh, robberies, oh, I got rapes. You're talking about campaign finance violate. Like, this is not the minor leagues anymore. You're talking about campaign finance and you're talking about violations. Like, I didn't even know that people did that. That had to be explained to me. And still, I could not wrap my mind around something so demented. I even heard from one of my contacts that when Alvin Bragg's office first got wind of these campaign finance improprieties, they were so disturbed by the nature of them that by nine o'clock the following morning, two of the senior prosecutors had resigned and one of the clerks who had actually first handled the documents, they committed suicide. Like, that's some pretty messed up campaign finance violation. I mean, even potentially accusing him of falsifying a legal document. Like, at what point are you not an animal when you're doing, like any man can kill, any man can steal. You just push him to that point, introduce the requisite socioeconomic factors, but supposedly violate campaign protocol seven years ago. Like at that point, how are you in practical terms different from Adolf Hitler? Actually, Hitler never violated campaign finance laws to my knowledge. Like say what you will about the guy. Hey, we can call a spade a spade, but even he never violated campaign finance laws. Like, are we actually supposed to believe this? Like, these people are just so personally offended and perturbed by campaign finance improprieties that they're making that the thing that criminally charges a president for the first time in US history? If you have 30 minutes, an open mind, and an internet connection, 
You can literally construct a case that would prove beyond a reasonable doubt actual examples of this with Hillary Clinton, with the Biden family, with the Podestas, with Soros. I mean, you know, you can make a whole afternoon of it, but that's not what this is about. And we know this, but it's still worth pointing out because the problem isn't exactly government overreach or political persecution. It's that they're doing it to Donald Trump specifically because he represents essentially the will of the American people. And if we had competent right-wing leadership that sent federal agents to raid properties owned by the Obamas, by the Clintons, by the Podestas, by Soros, Gates, et cetera, et cetera, you're not gonna hear me complaining about political persecution and government overreach because these are things that actually need to be done because these people have actually committed crimes and transgressions against the American people. But nobody hears about that. And nobody hears about the minor ones either. You know, Barack Obama, he violates federal disclosure laws, no indictment. He pays a fine, media doesn't cover it, average person probably doesn't even hear about it. Hillary Clinton, she pays for the fake Steele dossier, which causes years of dishonest media coverage against Trump, disrupts basically the entirety of his first term in office with, of course, the appointment of a special prosecutor. Turns out it's all illegal nonsense. No worries, no indictment, they pay a fine, media doesn't cover it, average person probably doesn't even hear about it. But with Trump, they literally have helicopters following his every move. Like he's OJ fleeing in the Bronco. It's insane. It is absurd. Like we've never seen anything like this before. And here's why that's not necessarily good, by the way. It's by no means a fatal blow, but it's not all good news because in terms of how this is going to affect the average person, there are basically two interpretations. The first interpretation of it is, well, where there's smoke, there's usually fire. They probably wouldn't have gone after him if they didn't have a case, et cetera, et cetera. And their perception of Trump ends up being worse than what it was. How much worse, what it was already, that's case by case, but on the net, it's not beneficial. The other interpretation of it is, well, these people have never given this guy a break. I mean, now they're trying to put him in jail. You know what? Maybe he was actually trying to do the right thing, et cetera, et cetera, and their perception of him on the net becomes more positive. Both of these are very possible, but I think you're going to see a lot more of the former than the latter. You're going to see more average people, people who don't really follow politics that closely, people who don't really follow the news that closely. You're going to see their perception of Trump become more negative on the net because to really take the second position, you have to be following politics closely enough to know that they kept going after this guy and that it amounted to nothing. That's the key component. People who aren't following as closely they're just going to remember that, you know, every time they turned on the news or they were in the gym, whatever, it always seemed like Trump was wrapped up in some scandal, which will just make them more likely to think that, well, they finally got him, right? Hey, they were right to finally indict him. The other thing is you have to be following closely enough to even know what Trump was running on and what his whole agenda in office was about. And the average person probably doesn't know that. I mean, maybe they know about the wall, but that's about it. So the left knows that this is going to poison the well a little bit more with Trump, and they're hoping that they can count on the cowardice of the GOP to continue moving away from Trump like they've been trying to do for a while now since people might think that he's too toxic or too problematic now or something. And that's another thing that we really went into in the Trump dissertation, the fact that pretty much all of the baggage that Trump has only exists in the minds of the public because of the incessant media freakouts over things that were ultimately not that bad, but that because of that nonstop coverage, they were able to somewhat effectively actually crystallize the public perception of Trump as this like corrupt incompetent. So that's why it's not all good news. It is going to turn some people off more so than already, but the good news is that it's unlikely any Anybody who's turned off by this was going to vote for Trump anyways. And it's also unlikely that this would push somebody who was Trump sympathetic over the edge against him. Like we said, anybody who is at least Trump sympathetic is far more likely to have this solidify their support for him. And that's why in the long run, on the net, this is good for us. This was inevitable. You know, this is going to move the ball down the field for us. I've never been one of these people, by the way, who thinks that we're going to have this like mass awakening people are going to realize how bad things are and, and they're going to act accordingly and they're going to mobilize. That's just not the way that these things work. It's not the, really the way anything works, but there is something to be said about this, like waking up people who do have the capacity to get it, so to speak. There really is a sort of Gnosticism to this actually. Moreover, this is going to solidify and energize the base. And already you've seen huge influxes of donations, huge crowds turning out to support the president. And we need that energy behind Trump to disarm the effort of the GOP establishment to try to move into this post-Trump terror Territory. And that's maybe even the greatest part of this whole thing. It's the perfect opportunity to find out where people really stand. It's the perfect litmus test. And we're not going to get a better one anytime soon. At this point, anybody who's not standing explicitly with Trump is aligned with the establishment. It's really that simple. So pay very, very close attention because again, we're not going to get a more clear litmus test anytime soon. We have friends and we have enemies and they are revealing themselves right now.
Ron DeSantis, he's got a great opportunity right now. He could endorse Trump for president. He could stand beside him and then 2028 would be his. Trump would campaign for him. He would be a national hero. I mean, this guy's young, he's in his forties. Why not just wait another few years? Why try to co-opt the torch from Trump prematurely? It's because he's got vipers whispering into his ear. Really interesting how the day that Trump's indictment is announced, Florida moves to rewrite the law, which currently says that the governor of Florida can't run for president during his term as governor. What a snake. Don't do this, man. It was so easy to do the right thing. And you still can, by the way. You can still be the guy. Just wait a little bit longer. You know you're not going to beat Trump. Like, don't kamikaze your political career. It's okay. Like, it's okay that you're not this larger-than-life figure destined for greatness like a Robert E. Lee or a Donald J. Trump. You can still rise to the occasion and do great things. You can be like a Stonewall Jackson. That's inappropriate, actually. I shouldn't use those comparisons. We know how you feel about that part of American history, Ron. You know, I was telling people to watch out for Ron DeSantis two years ago. Now people are seeing what we've known all along, that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards total Doyle vindication. And people actually have this delusional take. They're like, well, they're trying to put Trump in prison and prevent him from running for president so that he actually gets the nomination because they're really scared of running against DeSantis. Okay, first of all, if that were the case, they would just fortify against DeSantis too. Like the reason they're worried about running against Trump is because Trump is actually popular, far more so than DeSantis, by the way. He's a far better politician and he has a far better vision for the future of this country, along with the ability to actually inspire loyalty and hope within people, where DeSantis is basically John McCain or Mitt Romney with like an updated OS. Like look at the polling, look at the crowds, look at the two men. They're scared to run against DeSantis. Bro, DeSantis is scared to run against DeSantis. That's why they're trying to rewrite the laws. If he were so confident, he would just step down from governor of Florida right now and start campaigning instead of doing what he's doing now, which is basically everything involved in campaigning except not calling it campaigning. You know, Trump put out a book in 2016 titled Crippled America, How to Make America Great Again. DeSantis puts out a book in preparation for 2024. It's titled The Courage to Be Free. Like, what? I mean, that really says it all right there, doesn't it? Here's a fun game I played the other night. Take the phrase, the courage to be free, and infer from that like a vague sentiment, okay? Now, Google the books published by any one of your least favorite establishment neocons. It's literally the same. Like, if you took the vague sentiment from any one of the titles, you put them all next to each other, or you just kind of like squint your eyes, it's literally all the same. It's all recycled. It's repackaged. But only Donald Trump is communicating the message described by his title. And that's why people love him, because it's real, because it's true. It's not stale. It's not off the mark. People don't hear what Trump says and think, okay, yeah, I mean, that's pretty good, I guess. They're actually animated and excited by it because it's real. Before Donald Trump descended from the golden escalator, people didn't know that they had the ability to have these grievances addressed because at that point, the effective difference between the two parties was much more marginal than it was categorical. That's why the polling for Republicans is always doomed to inaccuracy because unlike Democrats, Republicans largely and correctly don't feel sufficiently represented by their party. Only about like a quarter do actually, which is why if you look at the polling for how Americans identify politically, Republicans are going to win the plurality over Democrats. But when you start adding options like undecided, none of the above, Tea Party, etc., then these win by far. Democrats come in second and then Republicans are like way behind. And a serious party would try to figure out why that might be, maybe adjust from there. But we're not a serious party. And I've seen this a thousand times. Maybe it's human nature. But people working in right-wing politics will have this almost maniacal commitment to an obviously stupid idea just because it's like a fantasy for them. Like they just want it to be true. Or also they have like this catty grievance against the person or people who are working towards the opposite, whatever that may be. But it's fascinating to watch. That's the really big problem that these people have with Trump. Because not everybody's going to be at the level where it's like a knowingly malicious thing because they're being paid to sell out their country. A lot of mediocre people just are coping with the feelings of inadequacy. I mean, it's like class insecurity. They can't allow Trump to be president, not so much because of who he is, but because of who supports him. You can really get a strong insight as to the contempt that even people who claim to be on our side feel towards our voters because they look at Trump's popularity, his insane popularity, not just in terms of numbers, but the like almost fanatical loyalty and love that his supporters have for him. And they are sooner to attribute this to low IQ cult behavior than they are to perhaps Trump more accurately understanding the needs of our country than they do. Like these people like to do nothing but masturbate to their own self images, serious political people. It's like, no, you're just losers. You look at who votes for Trump. You look at Trump supporters, they're business owners, they're attorneys, they're middle class, upper middle class, just like normal Americans. I mean, there's a reason that within the Trump community, if you will, Trump boat parades keep happening. Like, you're not going to be able to afford a boat if you're some unemployed hillbilly like both the left and establishment right like to portray Trump supporters as.
are just normal Americans who don't want to hate their country anymore and who want it to be respected again, but also who understand that in order for it to be respected, then it has to again become respectable. That's why the meme of Trump, like, they're not after me, they're after you, I'm just in the way. It's actually totally correct. Like, they have no issue with Trump beyond that he presents the opportunity to actually enact serious change in our country that would actually represent the will of its people. Before he did that, they loved him. Anybody who challenges the system will face this, which is now why they're trying to put him in jail for allegedly paying off somebody without crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's. You know, the Clintons would have just assassinated the person instead of paying him off. Like Trump is literally being punished for being too nice. He's literally being punished for not following these people's protocol in that sense. Now, you know, they're going to charge him with 34 felonies for like putting a payment that nobody cares about in the wrong column. And each one's basically the same. It's like copy pasted, but with a different date each time. And obviously they have no case. So it's either going to fail or it's going to stand because of a biased judge. And then it's going to fail after it's appealed. You know, I've heard that the Trump legal team is preparing to file motions to dismiss it based on the statute of limitations, the intent, uh, political motivations, among other prosecutorial overreaches. But even when this case gets tossed out, it's not over. Like they could have him declared ineligible to run under the insurrection clause of the 14th amendment, which still would probably fail because I don't think they'd get the votes in the Senate. And even if they did, then the Supreme Court would have to ultimately uphold it, which I don't think is likely. But the point is that it's not about one of these things working. If it does, great. The big thing is about demoralizing Trump and wasting his time and wasting his resources and doing the same to us. It's about creating obstacles and distractions, just like it always has been. I mean, if they do have to run against him again in 24, they'll be ready to fortify it all over again if Republicans don't do anything to stop that. Like, don't get me wrong, but they'll humiliate your president because they hate him. But more importantly, it does send a message to people out there who want to challenge the system because they hate what it's doing to our country, to a country that they grew up in and that they love. It doesn't matter if you're Donald John Trump, you're a beloved cultural icon, a household name, you've made billions of dollars, you've been articulating basically the same handful of ideas for your entire career in the public eye, ideas that most people agree with because they're objectively uncontroversial. People have been wanting you, begging you to run for office for decades. It doesn't matter. We will take that away from you. You can even have the support of tens of millions of American patriots. We will beat you down. We will use our media to take your reputation from you. We will use our systems of power to take your money from you, to go after your family. And even if you don't quit, there will be impediments to stop your agenda every step of the way, all in less than a decade. The image of Trump being arrested, that sends a message to people the people who he represents, and it says, give up. But maybe even more importantly, it sends a message to good people who want to take a stand for their country by challenging that power structure. And that message is, you will lose. And we just have to ignore that because so many times throughout history, particularly within the fight against communists, and I know it's kind of a meme at this point in certain circles to bring up things like the Russian Civil War, but there are so many cases where if people just held on a little bit longer, stayed focused, maintained the will to fight, they could have achieved the win conditions. They could have won, but they became demoralized, and ultimately that's what sealed their fate. And there's nothing more important than maintaining morale. Hope is a virtue, and I am eternally white-pilled. You cannot be phased by the humiliation rituals. They are designed to make you despondent. That's why we can't let the persecution of Trump demoralize us. We have to, we have to let it make us indignant, right? We have to embrace it. We have to wear it like a medal. If they don't mugshot him, that's why. It's gonna be because of that, because Trump would throw that image on a T-shirt and raise $20 million for his campaign practically overnight, because the persecution of Donald Trump vindicates everything that we've suspected about the rot in our country. And honestly, thank God for Donald Trump. Like, who else would have done this? Even if Trump fails, which he won't, a billionaire icon of American popular culture, supermodel wife by his side, that's truly the best last stand we could have asked for from an America that just doesn't exist anymore. Like, men from that cloth are no longer produced. He literally took up politics as a hobby, destroyed several American political dynasties just by being funny, made Americans believe in greatness again, in themselves again. Like, even even if this is just remembered as the dying embers of the fire, it's a great story and I'm proud of it. And I hope it doesn't get to that point, but I believe that these people will do anything, and I mean anything, to prevent Trump from being sworn in on January 20th, 2025. I mean, they've said as much. They've said under no circumstances can Trump be allowed to take office again. And I don't believe that they'll necessarily act on that. I don't believe that they can conjure the will to stop the man with the golden mane, but I believe that they believe that because I can't remember the last time their actions were less extreme than their rhetoric. Unless it's simply a failure to execute, which is different from a reasoned choice to not do something. And even if he wins again, it won't stop. I mean, it will never stop.
You are going up against one of the most sophisticated power conglomerates in the history of the world, and there's no escaping it. Like, you can only face it. Even if you go to a red state, you go somewhere, you know, away from the cities, they're effectively dropping paratroopers into your territory through things like social media, and it's going to make it blue within a decade or two. Like, your kids, your neighbors, if they have an internet connection, if they're even remotely tuned in to the regularly scheduled programming, they're consuming the propaganda, they're either going to support the incoming change or they will step out of the way of it. You can't run away from it. They're just going to build up more power and then come after you later. Like, that's why morale is everything. Pay very close attention right now to who is blackpilling. Pay very close attention to who's ready to throw in the towel. If you think it's bad now, you are not ready for what comes later. You know, I tweeted this out because I'm back on Twitter now. I said, once again, thanking God that our enemies are incompetent freaks who can barely hold eye contact while ordering a coffee. There's blood in you that fought off the British Empire. You will make it just fine against whatever this is. And some guy responded with, when is the right to stop pretending that its enemies are incompetent. They're the ones always beating us, which is ironic because I'm the first guy to point that out. Like, I've been saying this forever, but the thing is, that is actually compatible with my tweet completely because, yes, they have all the power, but these people are not the people who built that system. They cannot maintain this system. They are riding a wave of momentum that is destined to crash. Like, the people who are capable of maintaining this system, they're either turned off by it or they're heading into retirement or they're being gatekept from it because of affirmative action, mass immigration, etc. So, yeah, the propaganda is annoying. It's really annoying. Yeah, they're coming for our kids. Meanwhile, while U.S. global supremacy is collapsing, the economy is a tinderbox, and all of the people in charge of figuring this out are... This is not an unwinnable scenario. Like, anybody telling you otherwise is weak or stupid, or both. These extreme measures are just desperate attempts to reinforce and solidify their power. Their prideful victory laps, yeah, we're just going to have to kind of maintain composure through these, resting assured that we are not above our cycle of history. Well, Rosie O'Donnell's disgusting. I mean, both inside and out. You take a look at her, she's a slob. She talks like a, a, like a truck driver. Rosie attacked me personally because I was very happy when her talk show failed. The other thing that failed, and this was a real monster, and everybody was suing her, was her magazine. Her magazine called Rosie was a total disaster. So I loved it. I gloat over it. I think it's wonderful because I like to see bad people fail. Rosie failed. I'm happy about it. She's basically a disaster. Well, she called me a snake oil salesman. And, you know, coming from Rosie, that's pretty low because when you look at her and when you see the mind, the mind is, is weak. I don't see it. I don't get it. I never understood. How does she even get on television? I believe Barbara made a terrible mistake putting her on, and I think Barbara's probably paying a big price. If I were running The View, I'd fire Rosie. I mean, I'd look her right in that fat, ugly face of hers. I'd say, Rosie, you're fired. We're all a little chubby, but Rosie's just worse than most of us. But it's not the chubbiness. Rosie is a very unattractive person, both inside and out. Rosie's a person that's very lucky to have her girlfriend. And she better be careful or I'll send one of my friends over to pick up her girlfriend. Why would she stay with Rosie if she had another choice? She's trying to use ABC and The View to get even with me. But with me, we fight back.